Well, welcome back to Two Pastors and a Mic. My name is Corey. And I'm Shanik. And we're glad that you're joining us wherever you are. If you haven't, leave a review, share this with your friends on social media. We love all the feedback that we've been getting. We've been getting a ton of feedback lately. Welcome to all of you joining us on YouTube, watching us. Thank you for your support. We have had almost as many downloads in this year than we have in the two years prior. Yeah, it's so crazy. So we appreciate about. it. Yeah. Yeah. I so appreciate also the feedback we got after last week's podcast. Just personally, people have reached out, not necessarily Same. have left a review, but just talked about how much they love the podcast. And that was very encouraging and affirming to me, just getting back into it after a couple breaks being off. And so thank you for those of you who reached out and encouraged us. Yeah. And speaking of the question of the week and things that have happened over this past week, we did celebrate Pastor Tish, our children's pastor, for over 20 years in ministry this past Sunday. If you're part of Hill City, you saw us celebrate her. Pastor Tish, we know you're listening. We love you, support you, and thankful for your support in us. And I got to talking. I was in a counseling session this past week. I'm just going to set this up, yeah, and this yeah, is the question of the week. Um, I was challenging this guy who I've been seeing for five weeks, and he was talking about the type of person he is still wanting to become. And I had to pause him, and I said, hold on. We, we need to celebrate you for a minute because the version of you in week five of doing counseling with me is way different than the version of you than when you first walked in my office week one. And you did all this work. Sure, I might have been helping guide along the way, right? but you did this work. So yes, there, it's great to, to want to still become a better version of yourself, but if you don't celebrate those baby steps along the way, then what's the point of all this anyways? And because I was like, whatever destination you achieve, you're not even going to celebrate it then because there's always going to be a better version. Right. And it can be daunting and it can be discouraging. But and he responded, he goes, well, I don't know how to celebrate me. And we ended the this, this session early. And I said, well, that's your homework assignment is why don't you go ask the spirit how you can celebrate you? And so he left and uh, I shared this with our church. I, I do this really weird routine after every counseling session. I wouldn't call it weird. You take some time to decompress, to yeah, process. And I do, to... but I do some weird things that you would. It's okay. You, Yeah, in the counseling world, it's not weird, but I do some weird things. And, oh, I, I do things that I'd be embarrassed for people to see me do. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that? And as I was doing my thing, I just felt like the Spirit was asking me the question, hey, it's easy to challenge other people, but how come you've never asked me that question of how you celebrate you? And I've been thinking about it since last week. I don't know how to celebrate myself. And so I texted a whole bunch of people. How do you celebrate you? And some people had some good responses. Some people were like, I've never heard of that question before. Why are you asking? Uh, I, I've been contemplating. I've been asking the spirit, uh, how do I celebrate me? Is it is it just something I say out loud? I pause. I'm like, hey, I'm proud of myself today. And I did this thing with our church this week and right. had them repeat it. And it was weird, but it was great. And it, I had a lot of good feedback from it. It was like, man, yeah, I don't know how to celebrate me or I need to start celebrating me a little bit more. And I don't know, man, I'm just in this space because it's like, okay, do I go celebrate myself with food or drink? I do that already. I don't know if it's a part of, is it something that I need to purchase? Is it something I just need to say? So this is where I'm at. I don't know how to celebrate no, me. It is and I because I don't know how to celebrate me either. And I think both of us are alike in we really love accomplishment. Yeah. And if we're not accomplishing things, we feel inadequate. We feel like a failure. I know just last Saturday, I had one Saturday free. One of the first Saturdays I've had free in months, maybe all year, like with soccer and kids and all the stuff. And I didn't do anything. I think I watched like three movies that day, laid around, <laughs> ate, did nothing. And all day, throughout the day, I'm like, I feel like a worthless slob. Like, yeah. I got to do something. I got to accomplish something. I got to get something checked off today. And then I just kept fighting it and kept fighting it. And I didn't do anything literally all day. It's probably a good and thing. And it was probably a good thing. But sitting in that, thinking about how um, I have to be accomplishing to feel rewarded or to feel like valuable, I guess. Uh, and then the very next, that was Saturday. And then I think the very next day, or maybe it was that same day. You texted me. How do you celebrate you? And I'm like, <laughs> it might have been that same day. Why? Why are? Why are you asking me? It this? did because we were talking earlier, and I'm like, you're losing your mind <laughs> texting me. Like, what, you're like, I'm so bored. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, like, what do you want to do? You want to do something? You want to hang out? I was and like, I yes, did. but I got kids. I know. So, um, <laughs> I really set with a question for maybe it took me a couple minutes, but the only thing I could come up with is something you already said. Is, I mean, I love when I do accomplish something to celebrate something I've done or. 
that I've been a part of, hey, let's go out to dinner and have some drinks or something. Like, that's the only thing that I know, but it isn't like that's something special. Like, I go out to eat with Mel or with a family or date night or whatever all the time anyway. So, yeah, I really don't know how to do that well either. So I want to say if you're listening and you have ways that you celebrate yourself, whether it is small accomplishments, big task, or you know how to celebrate you for just being you without accomplishing, maybe reach out to us. Yeah. Let us know how you do that because we're in the process of figuring this out. And have you come up with anything? Yeah. Well, so I was talking with Julie on the way home from church and she's like, you're so accomplishment focused. Maybe how you celebrate you is thinking about rest and actually resting and what get up to an hour she goes up oh, probably an hour is too extreme for you but maybe you start at like five or ten minutes and you purposefully sit and think celebration speak to yourself about celebrating yourself where you're at in just a restful state and i was like you know what that probably it was a it was a trigger for me because i'm like yeah i struggle with rest even though i've done really well at ruthless elimination of hurry and trying to be present in the moment but really taking time out to celebrate myself in a state of rest. I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I'm four days in from hearing that and three days in. And yeah, one of the things that I thought of, which I don't know if this goes along with rest or not to me, it kind of does, even though it's an activity. So one things I, one of the things I love to do is just get outside and go for a hike, but I never do that because I think that it's a time waster. Hmm. No, I can't leave and just go by myself and go for a hike in the woods. Like, no, if I'm going to go, I got to bring my whole family with them. I got to have an experience with my boys or I got to be doing something else with my time than just aimlessly walking through the woods. But that's the one thing I came up with is when I want to celebrate, maybe I'll just plan a little hike an afternoon or a day or an hour, something and just go. I know that sounds like maybe work to you or not fun, but for me, it'd be a way to just decompress and celebrate, man, I'm just going to do something that I actually want to do. Yeah. And if you've never thought about this before, (laughs) welcome to the conversation. Seriously. I think it's really important that we learn to celebrate ourselves we had an episode, um, episode one, or no, episode 42, The Art of Celebration, where mm-hmm. we talked about how to celebrate other people, which again is a huge part of being human. But another aspect of being human is learning how to celebrate yourself. It is not prideful. It is actually a huge sign of humility because you are aligning yourself with how your father, your creator views you. And sometimes we have to celebrate ourselves and just praise ourselves for the things that we've accomplished and done power of Christ in you. Yeah. you know? And as we learn and grow, I'm sure you will be hearing about uh, about this on a podcast episode sure. that we talk about the art of celebrating you. The art of celebrating <laughs> at one, you. Yeah, at we're some in this point. process. Well, yeah, not right now. <laughs> not right now. No, uh, I still need to sit in this process and I still need to contemplate what I'm going to do to celebrate me. But yeah. it's huge because you can learn a lot about someone by what they celebrate. I think you learn more about someone by what they don't celebrate. And so why don't we celebrate ourselves, especially the baby steps along the way? No, it's crucial. I think we have to learn how to. Yeah. So So today. (laughs) Yeah. Last week, we talked about this episode of why religion is so attractive. Right. It stemmed from a conversation that we had with somebody from our church that was just checking out our church. And that conversation has led to a lot of conversations behind the scenes between you and I, uh, conversations we've had for several years, but we really, it, it came up. Right. And... So let me just give you some groundwork. We're probably going to do a series starting next week on the reasons why Jesus had to die. Right. Because the the question that the guy had in the conversation, if they didn't listen to the podcast last week, it was a conversation on uh, walking out, right? The command to love. And someone was like, that's it? Yeah. Like, what's the point of all this? If it's, you mean it's only to love and that's it? Yeah. Like they, they didn't know what the, really the point was of, of Jesus and why it came and all of it. Yeah. And so, uh, so that's kind of the context of setting this conversation up as well. Yeah. And so we are going to unpack because a lot of people will point that Jesus had to die to forgive the world of sin. Yeah. Well, you ask any kid, like I, I asked my kids, Hey, why did Jesus come? Yeah. Well, he had to die. He had to come to die for our sin. Yeah. You know, or why, why is Jesus so amazing? Well, because he died for our sin. And any question surrounding Jesus, especially with little kids, it's they've been, you know, only taught that it's because he died for our sin. That's why he came. That's why he had to die. Like all of it. That's the only answer. It's like that Sunday school answer, right? There's only one answer for every question that you ask. Yeah. And I think it's important that we just talk about this a little bit. Yeah. Well, we don't know if we're going to do just one episode and unpack it or seven episodes because there are seven reasons why Jesus had to die. 
and not one of those seven reasons are because of sin. And so there's a little fish hook that gets you to come back next week to unpack it. And you might be, what? Did Jesus have to die for sin? Uh, It's complicated. It's yes and no. Because the reality is he didn't have to die for sin. He had to die for other reasons. And I say that because Jesus was walking on the earth and he was forgiving people of sins before he died. So were they forgiven or not? And I do believe that God has the power to forgive sin outside of the sacrifice of the cross. But this conversation then goes into atonement theories, which if you're not familiar, there are seven. There's more than seven. There's 11, but there's seven atonement theories that a lot of people actually have. Scripture versus four. A lot of this has caused division and denominational splits over the church for the last several centuries. And so we're going to talk about actually a spicy conversation. Yeah. It, there's this blog. But it's a big conversation, a like big you com- just said, yeah. like seven like main ideas around atonement, which is atoning for sin and different ways to look at it. So this isn't a one size fits all. It's all, no, it's not just one thing that we can like hold true that unifies everyone because there's different ways to look at it. And it has been that way for now 2000 years. And like you said, has brought division, brought a lot of different denominations based on this one idea. So this is, this is a big conversation. Yeah. So today we're actually going to do seven reasons why Jesus was not sacrificed for your sins. And it's influenced by uh, this author. His name is Keith Giles. He actually has a seven series book. He's got a lot of books, but a seven series book called Jesus on I've read half of them. I'm still in the process of reading them. They're all phenomenal. I encourage you to get them, but I really like his blogs. They're very thought provoking. And he wrote a blog, seven reasons why Jesus was not sacrificed for your sins. And we talked about this last week and we're like, we should do a podcast on this because I didn't even know some of these things from a theological conversation. And so we're just going to unpack them. This is probably very new for you. Um, If you've never heard of this, just join us along for this ride. And we're going to talk about the death of Jesus and why it wasn't necessarily for sin. You want to do number one? Well, I can. I just want to reiterate, too, the reasons why we're having this conversation and what ultimately brought it up. And you you made reference to it. But all through the Gospels, we see Jesus walking around forgiving people's sins. Matter of fact, the, the, the paralyzed man that was brought to Jesus by the four friends, they dug a hole in the roof, lowered him down, and he looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. Hmm. And like, wait, Jesus has the power to forgive sin? This was pre-cross. Mm-hmm. And then later on, you know, it caused this uproar and he says, well, just, just so you know, like I have the ability and power to forgive sin. Let me go ahead and heal you right now too. So he healed him after he forgave the dude's sin. So like, you know, it's one of those conversations. If he was doing it pre-cross, then he had the ability to forgive. And it wasn't just the cross that allowed the forgiveness of sin. And okay, let's keep go here. Even before Jesus came on the scene, Abraham believed in who's credited to him as righteousness. So he was a righteous man even before Jesus. David, a man after God's own heart. Yet we know David is uh, an adulterer and a murderer. And yet, how can he be a man after God's own heart? Could it be that even before Jesus, we weren't labeled or known by our behavior? So So, food for thought. Yeah. But let's go through this This is interesting. The reason why we brought this blog up I hadn't heard about a few of these things until I read this blog. Yeah. And so it's very interesting as we compare like Jesus's death on the cross to actual old, old Testament references Mm -hmm. for the sacrifice of sin based on the Mosaic covenant and that system. Well, here's a, here's a few things. And yeah, I'll just like start it off. Here's the first reason why Jesus was not an acceptable sacrifice for sin. Number one, sin offerings had to be female. They had to be female animals, according to Leviticus 4.32. And that just says, but if he brings a lamb as his uh, offering for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without defect. And we all know Jesus was not female. (laughs) Yeah. Number two, sin offerings could not have any wounds, according to Leviticus 22.22. That verse says those sacrifices that are blind or fractured or maimed or having a running sore or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make them an offering by fire on the altar to the Lord. And as you know, Jesus was whipped, crown of thorns, all of it before he was nailed to the cross. That scars, yeah. Number three, sin offerings had to be taken to the priest and offered on the altar inside the temple, according to Deuteronomy 12, 13, and 14. But note that Jesus was not sacrificed on the altar in the temple. He was nailed to a cross by Roman soldiers outside of the city. And he wasn't burned. And he wasn't burned. So 
Okay, let's just keep going. Number four, human sacrifices for sin were an abomination to God, according to Deuteronomy 12, 18, and Ezekiel 16. You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God for every abominable act which the Lord hates. They have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. And again, it continues, but Jesus was a human being. Uh, and one of the atonement theories, which is known as PSA or penal, penal substitution. substitution atonement theory, says that Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. But based on these verses, they couldn't be. Right. So, well, in, in, according to the law. Well, let's track that one more further that goes along with it number five and check this out this was very interesting this is one of those that i was like oh my god i've never seen it heard it yep. didn't know there was scriptural context for it but number five god does not god does not allow any man to die for the sins of another according to psalm 49 7 and 8 where it says no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever. But of course, Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. Yeah. And so if we're in that family here, it says no man can by any means redeem his brother. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> well, verse, number six is this, is all are accountable for their own sins. A father cannot take responsibility for the sins of his children, according to Ezekiel 18, 20. And so that, yeah, again, coming back to, can Jesus take care of sin for humanity if everyone's accountable for their own sins, at least according to Ezekiel. Yeah. And number seven, this is something that I've actually preached on before. I think it was back uh, last year. Uh, when I talked about the temple sacrifice and we were talking about that whole system. Um, but it's very interesting because the sacrifice that actually took away the sins of the people. Now we're talking about in the old covenantal system, yep. that actual sacrifice was not put to death. It was a goat and it was set free in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And this is according to Leviticus 16, it was 9 called, and 10. It was called, it was called scapegoating. Scape, well, that's where we get the yeah. word scapegoating. Right. The, the, the priest would come and put his hands and basically symbolize a transfer of sins of the people onto the goat, and then they would set it free through through the, the town and out into the wilderness, mm -hmm. and then they would let it go. And, of course, we know Jesus was actually put to death. He yep. wasn't just put out into the wilderness. Yeah. So, again, these are a handful of reasons, at least according to scriptures. Again, we're not, we're not telling you, like, it's it, that Jesus didn't die for sins because there's other verses that says that Jesus did die for sins, but it's not the only reason. And Jesus did forgive sin before the cross. And again, you'll have to come back over the next couple of weeks as we unpack reasons for why Jesus had to die. But it, the reason why he, he didn't have to die for sin. Now he did, but he didn't have to, which is a really good, in my opinion, a really good conversation. And it will give you really good language and appreciation. And uh, yeah, it will remove some of the fear or even the PSA that we have towards God in atonement theories. In, in my opinion, it, it removes PSA from even the conversation. I think that PSA, and again, I'm talking about penal substitution atonement theory, has been one of the worst uh, theories and belief systems in Christianity because it causes people to fear God. Yeah, and if you put it in just the very simplest terms, it should cause you to question because in very layman's term, P PSA actually is God killed God to appease God. Yeah. Like, think about it that. It doesn't make sense when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> but I did want to read this. I, I love what Keith Gows and how he how he kind of closes out this this blog that he wrote. And I think it's important for us to still focus on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And right, God's response to our sin though is simply forgiveness. We are forgiven. And it's because of one simple reason. Jesus forgave us. Mm -hmm. Right? What Jesus did was only what he saw the father doing. And what do we see the father doing? When we look at Jesus, we see the father forgiving everyone he encounters, no matter what. And so Jesus really is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I love this. I love what he writes. He says, because Jesus takes even the worst possible sin we can throw at him, the torture and murder of an innocent man, even the son of God himself. And his response in this is father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the result, God answers this prayer that we are all forgiven. Yeah. So where was God even on the day that uh, Jesus was crucified? Well, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us, according to Second Corinthians. And so, yes, I thought there was no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Doesn't the Bible tell us this? Well, yes and no. 
to be honest. And again, we're going to unpack this in the next couple of weeks. But what it says in Hebrews 9.22 is that under the law, there is no forgiveness apart from the shedding of blood. But today, and since the cross, no one has been under the law. And so not only that, but there's a, a whole bunch of other examples where forgiveness, uh, the forgiveness of sins was proclaimed without the shedding of blood. Uh, Leviticus 14, the application of oil. Leviticus 5, the burning of flour. Number 16, the burning of incense. Exodus 30, the payment of money. Numbers 31, the gifts of jewelry. Uh, Leviticus 16, the release of a live animal. Again, the scapegoat, which again, we will talk about in uh, future episodes. And then Exodus 32, the simple appeals to God through the words or prayers. And so, yeah. No, God I... didn't murder Jesus. We murdered Jesus. Humanity murdered Jesus. God raised him from the dead. We sinned, but God forgave us. And again, he did that even before the cross. So Jesus took the worst we had to offer and still extended his boundless love, grace, and forgiveness to all of us before, during, and after the crucifixion. Yeah, And that's what we really want you to hear is that we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed, qualified, reconciled. That's how God views us. It's how he has always viewed us. And so then you might be asking the question, well, okay, then why did Jesus have to die? Well, you'll have to come back next week as we kind of dive in to all of the reasons why he, I, I believe he really did have to die. And, you know, just, well, no, I'm not going to give a sneak peek. I yeah, was going to let a little bit out. Hook, line, and sinker, for sure. No, it's good. Well, we love you. Hey, figure out what, how to celebrate you. I know we talked about that in the beginning, that we had a big, juicy podcast for you. <laughs> And then we're going to leave you. Learn how to celebrate you. And if you thought this podcast was interesting, never heard these perspectives before, send it to somebody, talk about it. Again, we're not saying we have all these answers figured out. I just thought it was very thought-provoking that brought me into a greater appreciation of God the Father and Jesus the Son. Yeah, and just to let you know, yeah, this did cause a lot of conversation even between the two of us. And there's still some things that we're processing. Yeah. There are other verses out there, scriptures out there, you know, uh, in Peter and in Colossians. And I think I sent you one um, just the other day about how, you know, uh, in his body, you know, Jesus bore our sin on the tree. And so how we have to process all of that uh, in this conversation mm -hmm. as well. And so we're not saying fully that he didn't die for sin, but we have to have the conversation because he was forgiving sin before the cross. Yeah. And so, yes, it was an amazing picture and it solidified um, I believe, you know, um, well, this is just where I'm at right now. It solidified the picture of God's love ultimately for us. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about that next week, but he doesn't see us as a sinner. I don't think he ever really has, but if we need something to hold on to, we can go back and hold on to that and know that at this point moving forward, um, for me, like he reset everything and it's a beautiful picture of more than anything, God's love for humanity. Yeah. You are loved. You're, you're his beloved and you're his favorite. Live like that by extending that love to everybody you meet. And as always, you're loved and there is nothing you can do about it.